Welcome to Cross Defense. You're listening to KFUO on the afternoon here. And this is Pastor Brian Wolfmuller hosting Cross Defense, your weekly dose of worldview demolition, recovering the joy of theology, the, do- the joy of the D word, the joy of doctrine, and setting our imaginations on fire with the clarity of God's word. I'm Pastor G- Brian Wolfmuller from Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado, and I am joined uh, on the show today by Pastor Sean Linnell of Trinity Lutheran Church in Blair, Nebraska. Did I get that right, Sean? Yes, you did. Welcome to the show. We're going to be talking about, we got a third guy joining us for the conversation, uh, Francis Pieper, joining us through his Christian dogmatics, and he, in fact, is going to, in some ways, lead the show. Uh, he, he wants to teach us, uh, as the great teacher, dogmatician of the church, he wants to teach us about the purpose of Christian theology for humanity. Why? even go about studying theology in the first place what what reason uh, do we have and we are going to talk about that together on the show uh pastor Linnell, how'd you guys do in easter over there you made it through all's well anything special happening easter was wonderful i mean hallelujah christ is risen and that's uh that's just about as special as you can get um you know easter services as far as uh doing things that are that are special you know sometimes we we take pleasure in the little things and uh we have uh, these very nice little banners that we hang up during the, the celebration uh, sort of series, almost like uh, kind of medieval uh, banners that just uh, sort of thin ones that hang down the, the row of the nave there. And, I, it, it, you know, it's nice that when we, we dress up things for the, the festival seasons, I really kind of love that. So that's that and the smell of lilies. It just makes it nice, you know. That's fantastic. I was thinking about... You know, every year at Easter, we hear these surveys where Christians are asked, if if we could find the body of Jesus, would we still believe in the resurrection? We were talking about this last week, but I just think this is so important for us to continue to think about during the season of Easter. Most people say, oh, if you found the body of Jesus, well, I'd still be a Christian. And to that, we have to say, no, that's wrong. Paul, St. Paul says, hey, if we don't know that Jesus is risen from the grave, if we don't know that the tomb is empty, then our faith is in vain, we're still in our sins, and this whole thing called Christianity is absolutely useless. Uh, so we have to we all have to always preach the fact that the, the real body of Jesus is raised, the real grave of Jesus is empty, that these things that we celebrate uh, but with all of our festivities, with the lilies and the banners and the uh, the meals and all the parties and everything else like that, it's a, it's celebrating the historical fact of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, that's one of the things that I try to uh, to teach people in like our you know our what do we believe or entry uh, you know classes and and the like is that the uh, what Christianity doesn't actually make a whole lot of is uh, what I would call faith claims, uh, meaning uh, claims that uh, don't have anything to do with reality or. You know, you just kind of have to believe in them, but there's there's nothing you know that ties it to the physical world. The resurrection of Jesus is is not a, a faith claim. It's a it's a history claim. It's a fact claim. Uh, and uh, what that means that he is actually who he says he is, you can say that that's that's a faith claim. But but if it's not true, uh, he's not a good guy. He's a, if it's not true, he's a charlatan. Um, but if it is true, oh my goodness, you know. That's right. It's true, and it's, and everything that Jesus does is also for us. So it's not only true that Christ is risen, but as the first fruits, it's true that we're going to raise from the grave too. That just to, that our graves will be just as empty as the grave of Jesus. Uh, I keep finding over and over again that that people, when they think about the resurrection, think about getting a new body, and they they just want to be done with the old body. But Jesus, if he was done with the old body, he'd still be there in the grave. He takes that body up into the perfection of the resurrection forever, and he brings us there as well. In fact, th- this is a nice place to bring Pieper into the conversation, who wants us to talk about the purpose of theology. And he's going to come around and say the purpose of theology is precisely this, that we attain to the salvation that Jesus wants us to have. That theology is not about um, pro- promulgating a Christian culture. Theology is not about making us better people, live better lives, do more good works. That's not the purpose of theology. Theology is not to what um, increase our knowledge or our wisdom. It's not like like philosophy or or um, some other academic discipline to make us smarter human beings. No, theology has as its purpose. To save us. Here, here's what, how Pieper says it. The purpose which theology is to accomplish in man after the fall 
is to save man from eternal damnation. The, uh, so this is the, a pretty clear thought, but I think it's pretty profound that when we go about this work of theology, the purpose is salvation. Pastor Linnell, any thoughts on this as we get going? Well, I, I agree with Peeper, of course. Uh, I just I do find it funny that uh, Peeper says this, and then they still give us grades in our theology classes. You know, uh, so what do you what do you call a guy who gets a C in theology class? Well, according to Peeper, uh, saved. So that's good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I I think that Peeper's really right on track. And it was um, I don't want to kind of jump out ahead of things too much, but it was one of the most profound things that I heard uh, when I when I you know first got into seminary and they were teaching me is. Um, is they said, you know, theology isn't something that you do. And I, and I was like, well, I have, an, I have an undergrad in theology. I, I spent four years doing that. And they're like, no, 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 no. Theology is not something that you do. Properly speaking, theology is something that is done to you. Uh, and and if, if theology isn't uh, working upon you to change you, uh, then whatever it is that you're doing, it's, it's not really theology. Maybe it's theodicy, maybe it's philosophy. But if it's uh, especially, you know, Christian theology, then it's something that is done to you, not something that you do. Yeah, theology comes from God, and he's always the one who's doing, acting, giving, speaking first. He's primary in all of these things. He's, he's, not, the, um, he's not passive. He's the one who's active in teaching, acting in, in saving us. This is why theology saves, is because it's not man's word. But God's Word, we've been talking for years on this show, Cross Defense. We've been looking at Francis Pieper, and he's, he's made this point so fantastically explicit that theology is not about the words of man, but about the words of God. And I think, Pastor Linnell, that's what you're getting at, because if it was man's Word, it couldn't save. But precisely because it's the Word of God that has us as the objects, we are the hearers of this Word, then in fact it can save, and it, and it does save. Right, and you know when he when he says there that the the primary object is is salvation, it's sort of like um, uh, you know when you preach, uh, you, you don't preach about the gospel, you preach the gospel, and in in the same sense, you know theology, it's it's not there uh, to teach about salvation, except sort of like in an in an eater, in an intermediate goal, it's it's there to to uh, bring about the faith which receives salvation, you know, salvation in a subjective sense. The, the point of theology is that the one who hears it might receive it. Say a little bit more about that, our preaching. We don't preach about the gospel. We preach the gospel. How can, what's the difference, and how can people hear the difference when they're listening to preaching? Right, well, uh, so... Uh, I'll give a little bit of a hyperbolic example. Uh, I think that you can do this in a much more subtle way, uh, but uh, if I was to – let me start here. If I was to say something like, um, you know, Jesus died on the cross, and if you believe in Jesus, then you can be saved, that's not the gospel. I, I haven't actually said anything uh, – positive about what you know Jesus has done for you like it's it's all just sort of there in a hypothetical or if I talk about you know Jesus dying on the cross but it's not actually related to what he's what he's done for you the the statement of the gospel is a it's a performative word and so you you don't you don't want to put it in if then statements or hypotheticals or or even um, just sort of uh, factual uh, but neutral statements. If you you preach about the gospel and about what Jesus did, I mean, okay, that's that's good, and the Holy Spirit can still use that because it's truth. But more properly, what preaching uh, should be um, is not this is the body and blood of Jesus, but this is the body and blood of Jesus for you, you know. And and so that's kind of the difference. Um, and theology, when you when you understand it, is just sort of this purely academic theodicy. Um, then it's just out there doing cute things, and and I think that's what most people think that theology is. You know, um, it's it's you know highbrow concepts that may or may not be relevant to my relationship with Jesus, and that's not the case. Uh, theology um, is is there to to actually describe your relationship with Jesus, and and more appropriately when when you're doing theology or when theology is being done to you, that's you growing in your relationship with Jesus. You can't grow in a relationship with somebody if you don't know anything about them, if you don't know anything about the, the nature of, of of your relationship with them. And that's that's really what theology is. That's what it's that's that's what it's supposed to be. Not how many angels fit on the head of a pin, 
but what is who is Jesus and what is my relationship with him? How is it between me and Jesus? Uh, Paul says this in 1 Timothy 4. This is a stunning, stunning passage, in fact, uh, and especially in these days where um, where doctrine or teaching is understood as a, as a bad thing. I mean, we hear this all the time in the church. It's about deeds, not creeds. Uh, doctrine divides. Love unites. Doctrine divides. We, have the, we live in an anti-doctrinal age, and so verses like this are really stunning. Paul says, 1 Timothy 4.16, Take heed to the doctrine, and you shall both save yourself and those who hear you. So St. Paul himself directly relates the, the work of theology, the, the office of the Christian teacher, to salvation, not only for the person who is uh, uh, hearing, but also for the person that's preaching. So that th- this line between doctrine and, and salvation is drawn directly by the Holy Scriptures themselves. Right, and and he doesn't want us to hear that purely as, um, you know, a... Uh, uh, professors in in the theology schools or even as uh you know preachers public preachers not just that but uh parents uh, head of the household as you should teach those who live in your household like the catechism begins right um so it you know it it says here and you know it uh that's how peeper begins there in in the first paragraph on 103 underneath that purpose of christian theology he quotes that from uh, from first timothy and also from matthew 13 and then he says because of this high purpose of theology the ministry of the Christian teacher is the most important office on earth, the good work. And what he's not saying is that, you know, by being a Christian teacher, uh, you earn extra favor with God or anything like that. But what he's saying is is just that. When, when you, say, as a parent, are teaching your children about Jesus, that's, that's more important than feeding them. And, and I'm not saying that you should refrain from feeding your children, Right. But if you feed your children and you never teach them about Jesus, they live a good long eighty years, they die, and then and then that's not good, because uh, they've there's there can't there can be no faith without without hearing, right? Um, but uh, if your children uh, starve because you're in a terrible place in the world, and and these terrible things happen, but you have taught them about the gospel, they will be raised to eternal life. So if you had to choose, if you were in the terrible and awful position where you had to choose, do they receive the gospel or do they receive food? You would give them the food that leads to eternal life, not the food that keeps them alive for this short period of time. Theology is concerned not just with life temporal, but with life eternal. Uh, There's three estates, and this is so important for us to remember that the Lord has arranged things both uh, temporally and eternally. He's arranged things to care for our body as well as our soul. So we have the family chiefly and um, and the state to take care of temporal things. But the church, and this extends over into the Christian family as well, is taking care of things eternal so that there is a there's a higher goal here. There's something more to be pursued. There's something uh, higher to chase after, not just to live in this life, but to live eternally in the life to come. And that is the the work of theology now this has to be contrasted to some other ideas that theologians might have about what their work is it, um dr peeper says the purpose of theology is not to spread culture or to establish civil righteousness although christianity is one thing that really makes good citizens and promotes true culture so he says she says christianity and christian theology Make, causes people to do good works, and it creates a culture. It has a civil righteousness. But that's not the purpose of it. That's more like a, what, a side benefit of it uh, that, um, that, that oh, it's not, not a side benefit. It's almost like an afterthought. But the primary goal of theology is not a better culture. It's not better people. It is eternal salvation. And how the Lord does that, uh, we want to talk about as well. I'm Pastor Brian Wolf. You're listening uh, to KFUO, and this is Cross Defense, your weekly demolition of worldviews. I'm here with Pastor Sean Linnell of Trinity Lutheran Church in Blair, Nebraska, and we're talking about the purpose of theology, which is our salvation, your salvation, your family's salvation, the salvation of sinners, the salvation of the world. We're going to take a short break here, and we'll be back on the other side to talk about what the purpose of theology is not. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
This week on the Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah, we'll learn about what takes place in Holy Week and other cultures from some of our veteran missionaries. We'll continue our celebration of National Volunteer Month with Lutheran Young Adult Corps. We'll take a look at a new Bible translation with the Reverend Dr. John Sias, and we'll learn about new laws that may affect some parents in Midwest states. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah, weekdays at 9 a.m. on KFUO. Underwritten by Concordia University, Wisconsin. Your smartphone takes you anywhere instantly. At a click, you can read, watch, or hear just about anything. Some websites are good, some are bad. Some sites truthful, and others are deceptive. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Hear the truth of Jesus daily on Worldwide KFUO. Using today's smartphone technology, KFUO brings the gospel to you wherever you are. KFUO is just a click away, 24 hours a day. KFUO.org. I'm World Lutheran News Digest host Kip Allen. Every day, things happen that affect the lives of Lutherans worldwide. Whether it's mercy efforts to a disaster-stricken community, threats to religious liberty, or cultural trends, World Lutheran News Digest takes an in-depth look at one issue each week as I interview newsmakers and experts, while Sarah Golseth presents a quick look at the week's news. World Lutheran News Digest may be heard every Wednesday at 2.30 and Saturday at 9.30 on Worldwide KFUO. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. Each weekday, the servants of God at the LCMS International Center gather together to receive the gifts of God in His Word. I invite you to join us weekdays, 10 a.m., for a live broadcast of daily chapel services on KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Welcome back. You're listening to KFUO. This is Pastor Brian Wolfmuller of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado, host of Cross Defense, here on your Monday afternoon, uh, coming to you live with Pastor Sean Linnell of Trinity Lutheran Church in Blair, Nebraska, and Dr. Francis Pieper of Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne, Indiana. He's in glory now, but he's left for us a beautiful testimony of the teaching of the Lord's Word, and so we're having a conversation talking about what it means to do theology in these gray and latter days as the world is falling apart, as, um, as, the, as darkness reigns, as, as the, the culture and the minds of the people around us become more and more secular. The, the light of the Christian truth and the Christian gospel seems to us, as, at least from casual observers, to be growing dim, and yet the Lord Jesus has said that his church would stand to the end, and when he comes back, he will find faith, his remnant, his people waiting for him, looking for the salvation uh, that is to come. So, with that in mind, we're asking the question, what is the purpose of theology? Why do theology, why engage in a study of theology? And the purpose, uh, Dr. Pieper told us, was so that we would be saved. He quoted First Timothy 4, where it says, Give attention to the doctrine, because by doing so, you will save both your hearers and yourself, so that the work of hearing and believing the true things about Jesus and about us is, the, um, is what saves us. It's what rescues us and what delivers us. Now, we want to contrast that, and this is the way the Bible teaches. You've heard it said, I say to you, so we want, to, we want to contrast this purpose of theology to save us with some other possible purposes of theology. And Dr. Pieper has mentioned a couple, the spread of culture and the establishment of civil righteousness. Both of these, he says, are not the purpose of theology. Pastor Linnell, why not? Well, well because the purpose of theology is that, is that we might be saved. Uh, you know, uh, in the Bible, and this is kind of what we had talked about uh, a little bit the last time that I was on, the difference between uh, fundamental and, and non-fundamental doctrines. Uh, there there are uh, claims about history in the Bible, uh, people, places, events, uh, and those things are true because everything in the Bible is true. And uh, I'm, I'm going to probably screw up uh, exactly which institution this is, but there was this uh, wonderful letter that was written into like the uh, the Natural History Museum or something, and they were asking about whether or not, you know, the Bible is a good historical text. You know, do they believe the things in the Bible are true? And what they wrote back with was, you know, we we don't believe in the miraculous events of the Bible, uh, but 
generally speaking, if we want to know where a culture was, yeah, we, we look at the Bible and say, you know, where did they say it was? Because uh, the Bible's always right on that account. Uh, that's really cool. Not the purpose of theology, though. Like, it's great, and it's important. I'm not saying that it isn't. But the primary purpose of theology is not, you know, uh, a historical theology that goes about and gives us this wonderful history of things that happened in the past, unless you're talking about what Jesus did on the cross to save you from your sins. Um, so, you know, it's it's about that. It's about the cross. Everything that's in there leads and pushes to the cross because that's your salvation. And not just the cross like in a vacuum or in a hypothetical or in a, you know, that happened, but in a that happened for you uh, specifically kind of way. Um, so when you do things like, uh, like again, uh, the, the, the idea to promote uh, a civil righteousness, um, the, the Bible is not to be used, um, Mr. Thomas Jefferson, uh, to, to promote uh, a populace that behaves themselves. You know, uh, the, the Bible theology is not the opiate of the masses to make them compliant to, to the government. Um, people may try to use it that way, but that's that's not what theology is. Nor is nor is it like a liberation theology to be used by those who feel that they're oppressed, so that they might have some sort of uh, rallying cry upon which to say, "Oh, look, you know, God, you know, frees and you know the captives. He's on our side, and God wants you know uh, the 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 proletariat to." You know, that's just not what it is. Um, it's it's about Jesus dying on the cross for your sins. And it's not about how many angels can fit on the head of a needle. It's not about uh, cute puzzles and quizzes, you know, to keep those uh, who don't have enough to do occupied, who think that they're smart and wise to devise interesting questions. It's, it's not about that either. It's about Jesus dying on the cross to save you from your sins, who rose from the dead so that you too may be raised by the power of him who rose his son from the dead to eternal life. That's what theology is. Theology is not, people are also going to say, it's not to satisfy the intellectual craving of the human mind to enrich human knowledge in general. Although it does, it answers questions which baffle human wisdom and so forth, but that's not the purpose. This is not, this is not curiosity for curiosity's sake or education for education's sake. Uh, I, I know, and I think this is an interesting thing to consider, I've, I've long wondered how it is that uh, that there are people who teach the Bible or who teach theology who don't believe it. I mean, I had a, I had a class uh, in college called uh, "The Bible is Literature," and the teacher um, had didn't believe a single word of the Bible was true, and yet this was now her life's work was to teach it, and that always confounded me. But I think that's probably what Peeper is talking about here. Those who who use the study of this book like they would study another book, you know, like you would study. Um, like you would study Homer, or you would study Plato, or you would study some other um, Shakespeare's a piece of literature. You're just studying it just so you know more about the thing. You become an expert in the thing. You write about the thing. But it doesn't have anything to do with what you believe is true or right or good. Yeah, I, you know, and that's and so that's another one of the things that, uh, that also sort of blows my mind a little bit, because especially uh, in today's... Um, you know, setting when we we talk a lot about like cultural appropriation, uh, I I feel like uh, if you if you don't believe that that the Bible is true, and then you're you're going to go ahead and you're going to take that up and sort of dedicate your life to interesting topics that you you know because you don't think that this is true, like people that that you know they get their doctorates and then they write these really thick books about you know what they think are very interesting ways to reinterpret you know the meaning of 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 the scriptures that's that, that's religious appropriation right there like what are you what are you doing and it's i find it to be incredibly disrespectful too um and there are a lot of people i think that that don't believe and that can still uh study because they have a a, a respect for what's going on um, but it, it also sort of blows my mind that, that somebody would dedicate their lives to the study of, uh, of this scripture uh, when it claims to be one thing, and then just uh, sort of with complete disregard, uh, tear it up and write some pretty uh, inflammatory things. Um, and what Pieper says later on in that same paragraph, which is then on, on page 104, is that um, they don't deserve to be heard. They, you know, they don't uh, deserve... Uh, our time in in reading that, 
if if a theologian or a book presents itself um, and does not present uh, or presents itself in any other way than than theology the way that that he says that that it is theology that has the aim of salvation, then you don't even need to bother reading it. You don't have to engage with that. Uh, you can engage with people who who uh, maybe teach some false things, um, people who who think and who approach theology with the aim of salvation, um, but they're they're wrong. Um, and you can engage with them. Luther does all the time. But once you get into the realm of people who are are doing theology because they think it's cute, uh, I don't have to, I don't have to engage with that. It's it's incredibly disrespectful. And it's a waste of everybody's time. Paper quotes Walter, who quotes Meisner. How about that? So this is going to be Wolfmuller quoting Pieper, quoting Walter, quoting Meisner. This is very meta. But here comes a quote which is worth our hearing. The theologian who does not continually pursue this purpose and does not make the salvation of men the objective of all his study and teaching does not deserve to be called a true theologian. So if you miss this, you're not a theologian. You're just goofing around. You're just playing. But you're not doing theology because God's purpose with theology is to save us. Right. And, you know, I know that that comes across like a little mean and, and a little harsh, and I don't mean to be so overly negative. So let's let's make a comparison um, so that we can understand why this is this is so serious. Um, if there if there is an individual um, who who really likes um, what they think is medicine, but it's not medicine, they're not a doctor. If if your goal is is not. To, to help people, but you just think it's like cute to, hey, why don't you try and eat this? What would that do? You're not a doctor. And and people shouldn't listen to you for health advice. In fact, we, we probably shouldn't listen to you at all because you're a crazy person. And so in, in the same way, if if theology is the medicine of salvation and those who teach it are administering a spiritual medicine, if, if your goal is has nothing to, and your purpose has nothing to do with it as as a medicine then um at the at, at the very least um you're you're being disrespectful and and possibly you're going to hurt somebody spiritually so we're not trying to be um arrogant in that sort of respect like oh nobody should listen to you because you're a dummy no that's not what we're saying but in the same way that somebody who tries to give you medical advice who has no idea what they're talking about and they're just telling you to eat random things um also don't listen to people who give you spiritual or theological advice that don't have as their aim the salvation of your soul the old theologians define the purpose of theology quite well when they say this is fantastic the subject of the operation of theology is homo peccator, insofar as he is to be led to eternal salvation. Uh, in fact, it goes on to say, society or the state concerns itself also with homo peccator, not for the purpose of saving souls, but for the purpose of protecting, uh, by means of temporal punishment, the body, bodily life and temporal goods of its members against the outburst of wickedness inherent in human nature. Theology, however, is not concerned with the civil punishment to be meted out but to the evildoer. But rather, it's the business of the theologian and the Christian church through the preaching of the law and the preaching of the gospel to bring men to eternal salvation. So the object of theology is homo peccator. That means man the sinner, man the lawbreaker, man the deserver of God's wrath. This reminds me of that great, great, great Luther quotation from the, his introduction to Psalm 51. And he says, The doctor looks at a man and sees the man in terms of health or sickness, the lawyer looks at a man and sees him in terms of contracts. You know, the banker looks at a man and sees him in terms of debts and liabilities. But the sinner, the, the, the theologian looks at a man and sees him as a sinner. Uh, the one who deserves God's wrath, the one who is the object of Christ's saving work. So say a little bit about this, this, um, this great old phrase, man the sinner. <laughs> Indeed, right? Yeah, the, the old Adam that is in us, uh, uh, the, the sinful nature. And this kind of gets back to, you know, to what I had started with, that, that theology isn't, it isn't something that you do, but it's it's something that's done to you. That that a, a, a theologian, that a, a, not a, a theologian, because it's kind of, people think about that, then they think academic, but but no, when when you are, are teaching uh, Christianity, right, uh, when you are doing those things, uh, you, you are uh, applying a, a medicine to uh, to a soul, uh, a soul that is uh, sick, uh, that as the Bible says is is 
is dead already, and that that you are, are trying to to bring the words of e, of eternal life there. And so, uh, again, it's it's uh, I love how he brings in uh, law and and gospel and and how they are to be used. That that uh, theology is there um, to to convince the sinner that they are a sinner and that they have need of Christ, and then to have that already there and and, and presented not as an if then statement, right? Because that's law, that's not the gospel, but to convince the sinner of his need for the medicine that that the gospel there already provides, um, and and I think that that's again that's an important uh, direction for us to remember. That that theology uh, works upon theology does something, but the Holy Spirit, through the hearing of the gospel, creates faith in dead sinful hearts, and that's what theology is. Theology is a uh, gospel applied to sinners, which Holy Spirit and law and gospel applied to sinners, which the Holy Spirit used to to uses to create faith, which receives salvation. I love that. Pebert says that the law is to convince the homopakater, the sinful man, of his guilt before God and of the certainty of eternal punishment to be meted out to the transgressor. Now, I think this is a really important point because a lot of times, if you, you know, if you just talk to people about, I don't know, right and wrong, good and bad, and you ask people if if they are good or if they are bad, they will generally say, well, I've done some bad stuff, but I'm a good person. This is just the the conclusion that our sinful flesh makes about itself. I'm a pretty good person. And in fact, I think that goes all, all the way down so that w- when you start preaching the law to, th- to people, to saying, hey, you're a sinner, they'll say, oh, yeah, that's true. I've made mistakes. To err is human. Everybody makes mistakes. But the law goes further. It doesn't just say that you've broken the law. It says that you've broken the law of God, that you're guilty before God, and that you deserve eternal punishment from God. Now, that is a step too far for the flesh. I mean, the flesh might know that it's made mistakes, but it can't know that it deserves God's wrath. Our flesh might know that it's it's done some things that are wrong, but it can't know that it, it should be in hell forever. It just can't get to that knowledge. That has to be revealed in the law. And Pastor Lenau, I'm interested to know what you think about this. I've been thinking about this distinction between a troubled conscience and a terrified conscience. A troubled conscience, which might say, um, yeah, I've done some things wrong. But a terrified conscience knows not only that it's done some things wrong, but that it deserves, because of those wrong things, it deserves God's wrath. It deserves hell itself. About we got about a minute before our next break. Any thoughts on on that and the preaching of the law as revealing of God's wrath? Uh, it, it sounds uh, fairly similar to uh, the distinction of uh, I'm sorry because I got caught and I'm sorry because of what I did. You know, those things are different. Um, a person who's sorry because they've made mistakes wishes that they would have done better because they wanted to be better. I feel like you know, the, the person who has a, a really terrified conscience and understands why they deserve the, the just uh, uh, wrath of God uh, understands their faults because of how they've hurt other people. And not as a mistake, but because you wanted to. Like deep down, you wanted to. You cared more about yourself than anybody else. And you did those things because you thought it would benefit you and it hurt everybody around you and you didn't even care. And maybe you care now, which is good because that's the Holy Spirit working on you. But if if like, Sin is not a mistake. Like You did that because you wanted to. Sin begins in the heart with the desire to serve yourself, not anybody else. That is the first work of the theologian, preaching the law. And then there is the second and proper work, which is preaching the gospel. That's what we're going to talk about when we come back. That's Pastor Sean Linnell from Trinity Lutheran Church in Blair, Nebraska. I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller from Hope Lutheran Church over in Aurora, Colorado. If you're hanging around Aurora this weekend, we're going to be hosting a conference here at Hope. Uh, the Hope Live Conference, talking about the absolution, Friday night, all day Saturday. Uh, you can visit the website hope-aurora.org and find some more information about the conference. We'd love to have you. Stay with us through the break. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. I'm Gary Duncan, the General Manager of Worldwide KFUO. 
In Romans 10:17, we read, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. There's a great need among the people of this world to hear the word of Christ, a need to hear about the hope, love, mercy, and salvation found in Jesus. As a partner with us, KFUO becomes your voice to declare the gospel of Christ to those still in darkness. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. That's John 20, 21. When you make a gift to KFUO, we together as one voice go out to the world and proclaim that good news of Christ through this radio ministry. Join us for Sherathon 2018, April 19th through 21st. Celebrate your radio station and enjoy your favorite host and guest during this three-day Sherathon event. Again, Sherathon 2018 is April 19th through 21st on WorldwideKFUO.org and AMA50 KFUO in St. Louis. The messenger of good news. In 1931, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was already considered one of Germany's most prominent pastors and theologians. As early as 1930, candidates for ordination were embracing Hitler's emerging anti-Semitism and the new German Reich Church. Bonhoeffer began training pastors in support of the Confessing Church, a movement resisting Nazi influence on German Protestant churches. He taught seminarians and wrote The Cost of Discipleship, which guided Christians on how to live according to Jesus' teachings in the Gospels. The book included reflections on the Sermon on the Mount from the Gospel of Matthew and has become a classic of Christian theology. Bonhoeffer eventually joined the resistance movement and was ultimately imprisoned for his role in a plot to assassinate Hitler. On April 9, 1945, a month before the war ended, Bonhoeffer was executed. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. Welcome back to Cross Defense. Pastor Brian Wolf, you're there from Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado. Uh, taking you through the next few minutes, talking about the role of salvation and doctrine, or the role of doctrine and salvation, with Pastor Sean Linnell, Trinity Lutheran Church in Blair, Nebraska. Uh, Pastor Linnell, you, you let us have it with the law, uh, going into the breaks, uh, pointing out how not only are we sinners, but we want to be sinners. I mean, it's a desire. Our, we... Our flesh loves sin. We're not. We're doing all this on purpose. We we become God's enemies, and then the gospel comes along and tells us something entirely different. Instead of instead of showing our sins, the gospel comes along and forgives our sins. Peeper says that this that the law convinces the sinner of his guilt before God and the certainty of the eternal punishment to be meted out to the transgressor, but the preaching of the gospel brings him to the remission of sins and eternal salvation. So the so that the work of theology boils down to these two words, the word of the law and the word of the gospel. And the gospel is that Jesus forgives us, Jesus loves us, Jesus has mercy on us, Jesus died for us and rose for us, and everything he does, it's still for us. He prays for us, intercedes before the Father. He declares us righteous, and he sends that word to us so that we can know that we are loved by God and not as enemies. So that these two words are really... Uh, the word of law and gospel, th these words are what theology is. Yeah, indeed. Uh, you know, our, our epistle lesson from this past Sunday uh, with First John, uh, if you're in the three lectionary, I, I think does that really well. Like, man, John is so excited to to preach uh, and to write and to proclaim to us when he writes this letter in First John. You know, and he says that that I am I am writing these things to you that you might not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, right, Christ Jesus, and and I think that that again is uh, this really great uh, sort of subtle distinction between law and gospel that's brought out uh, really well here by Peeper. You know, when when God's word, when theology works on the the you know the whole of the um, if you're talking about uh, trying to you know force the home of Picotter to do or not do a particular thing, uh, and, you know, the law The law doesn't motivate to good works. It, it might curb some of the evil. Um, it might force you into position, but those things aren't aren't good works. What the, what the law does is, you know, convinces you of your, uh, of your sinfulness and your need for a savior. And yeah, I mean, the words before the break were pretty hard, but look, I'm, I'm a terrible human being. I, I'm not proud of it, but I can't hide it, you know? Uh, sometimes uh, people that I think don't know me very well, they're like, oh, you're a nice guy. And I'm like, no, I'm really not. But the Holy Spirit working through me uh, perhaps does some nice things on occasion. And that's and that's the thing is we sit here as Christians 
when we sin as Christians, um, if if we are doing those things because you know we we love sin, and you're you're going off in that direction, Peter much later I think in in his volume three is going to say you should really consider whether or not you're a Christian in that regard. Uh, but human motivations are really complicated. Uh, we are sinners and saints at the same time. And and that's why, at least uh, until we go to heaven, until the resurrection comes, uh, you know, theology in this regard is always going to have something to do on us, both with law and gospel, in, in curbing that sinful nature, uh, reminding us and convincing us, in spite of all of the assaults of the devil or sinful flesh in this world, that, that we do need Jesus and that we're not good people, and then, and then giving us that good and gracious gospel. So I, I really think that that's... You know, what he's saying here uh, should remind us all uh, as hearers and as teachers that everything that, that you're going to learn uh, in theology and church in a, in a confirmation class, all of that is related to your relationship with, with God and with one another, and it is supposed to lead to, to salvation. Yeah, Peter says that, hey, to get that salvation, don't forget, by the way, that you have to f- have faith. And he quotes John 3, uh, verse 36 and where jesus says he that believes on the son has everlasting life and he that believes not on the son shall not see life but the wrath of god abides on him still so that the intermediate purpose of theology the way to get from man and his sin to the eternal salvation that the lord wants to give to us is the creation and preservation of faith paul says that faith in romans 1 5 is the cause of theology when he calls when he says that his apostleship is for the obedience to the faith so that it's it's um so that the preaching of law and gospel is there but it um it has this intermediary work which is to create and to sustain faith uh in the sinner Th- thoughts on this and in fact i, I was interested that that people wanted to include this in here. Thoughts on why this section gets included? Because we could have had a lot of things in here as the as an intermediate cause, but he wants this to he wants to highlight this as as the as the way to get to the salvation that the Lord has for us. Yeah, I think uh, I think what he's doing here, and, and again, kind of what he's setting up is like the difference between uh, objective and subjective justification. You know, uh, Christ died on the cross uh, for your sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world, right? But that's great. So why doesn't why isn't everybody saved? Well, um, it, he, Jesus does this by grace alone, and and yet this this gift is received by faith alone. And so uh, Jesus does what Jesus does, and Jesus says what Jesus says. It's the body and blood because he says so. But the benefit of those things is received by faith. And so what theology is doing is it's telling you something objective. And then what the Holy Spirit does through the hearing of that objective proclamation is something subjective to you. And what that subjective thing is, is creating faith, right? Jesus does things for you. The Holy Spirit does things to you. Uh, and so in in another sense, then, uh, we might uh, relate this to like the um, uh, the Norma Normans versus uh, Norma Normata, right? Uh, God's word is the norming norm uh, that cannot be normed. It's God's word is the thing. But what God's word does is uh, shapes us, shapes our words, shapes our culture, shapes our hearts to conform to himself and to his word. And when that happens, what do you get? You get right doctrine. You get confessions. That's why we have the confessions that we have. That's why we have creeds. And so when somebody says something like, you know, uh, deeds, not creeds, and then you, you say something like, so you don't care about faith, because that's what creeds are. It's it's just the, the vocalization of of the faith, you know. And, and I think in that respect, we should probably take Jesus's example on that, right? Uh, like, um, and it's, it's in the beginning – um, is at the beginning of Mark's gospel, there's the paralytic guy who's, you know, lowered to him through the roof. And then uh, he says, you know, your sins are forgiven. And then, uh, you know, the Pharisees like, well, nobody can say that except God. And he's like, well, so that you may know the son of man has power to forgive sins or authority to forgive sins, uh, you know, stand up and walk. The, the proclamation 
is what happens first and then leads to those good works, uh, leads to that love and service for one's neighbor because good works also are going to you know begin uh, by the Holy Spirit working in your heart. And so when he does this, when he brings this around and he says, you know, the intermediate uh, thing is that faith is created in you. Uh, I think that's that's kind of what he's getting at. You know, all of these things that theology, yes, it's it's proclaiming things that are true and that are objective outside of you. But the goal is that there's something subjective that happens inside of you by the power of the Holy Spirit working through those things so that you yourself might create those same words with your mouth coming out of your heart. And then being able to create those same words with your mouth, you might possibly, by the power of the same Holy Spirit, uh, create those works with your hands. This is also what Ephesians 2 says, right? Um, because uh, uh, Ephesians 2 and uh, how uh, that begins there with 8, right? For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift, gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So yes, th there are good works. There's there's good things you know to be done, but there there is a progression and there are the steps and it's the proclamation of something objective, uh, something subjective that happens inside of you by the hearing of those things, the power of the Holy Spirit, and then afterwards those those good works happen. Does that yeah. make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I think th um, we have similar scripture passages so that faith, for example, in Romans, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, and, and we rejoice so that first comes God's word, then comes faith. And then after that, uh, follows all the fruits of faith. So love, good works, confidence when we die, and all these sorts of things. But the pro but salvation comes in at, at the proper place. We don't put the salvation after the works, uh, nor do we put salvation before the f the faith. But in fact, we put it right there that salvation, uh, when the Lord gives us this gift of faith, then we have uh, the gift of salvation as well, and all these other things. Uh, start to follow. I, you were reminding me of this passage in in Luther, where, and it's a stunning passage where, where Luther says in the Large Catechism uh, that the death of Jesus wouldn't benefit anybody at all unless the Holy Spirit sees to it that the word of that death or the news of that death is preached throughout the world, so that it's not until the word of reconciliation, the word of the gospel, the word of absolution, the word of the Lord's kindness gets to us, that then uh, we have the benefit of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So that theology, really, as far as theology is preaching of law and gospel, is the Holy Spirit getting the benefit of the death and resurrection of Jesus precisely to the sinner. And we have it when we believe it. We have it when we trust the promise. We have it when we know that these things that are true are true also for me. You mentioned it earlier, Pastor Linnell, the for you of the gospel, that the, that the Lord is pressing the benefit of the death of Jesus straight into our ears and straight into our hearts. Right, and, and, and this isn't just something that is done by academics or even by pastors, the the things that you talked about, the, the you know proclaiming of law and gospel, the teaching of God's word, theology, is done by he says you know Christian teachers. It's done in your home. This is done by by you parents and grandparents as you're teaching your children uh, what God's word actually says and what it means for them. This is this is done as you do this for for your loved ones and for your friends. So don't think this is just you know for two guys on the radio or two pastors or academics. Peeper is writing this um, about about you. Uh, Peeper is going to go on to say that there's some other. So you have an intermediary cause. So the 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 work of theology is to get to salvation. You have something that comes first, which is faith, and then you have stuff that comes later, which is works and another number of other things. Sanctification and good works are another objective of theology. Theology teaches believers to be careful to maintain good works, Titus three, and so forth. But this is carefully distinguished from any sort of understanding that we are saved by our works. Not only is that not theology, that's the opposite of theology. That's a damnable doctrine. That's an anti-theology. What, what Paul curses in Galatians 1, if we're saved by our works, let, let, uh, you know, that's, that's anathema. So that, so that good works follow, they follow faith, but they do not, um, 
they are not the cause of salvation. Help us through that quick distinction. I know we got pages and pages of paper on that, but he brings it up here in a paragraph, so let's give a paragraph worth of conversation to it now. Sure. Um, so uh, an apple uh, does not an apple tree make. An apple tree makes an apple. You, you first plant a seed, the seed grows into a tree, and then that tree produces good fruit. You can't expect the tree to make fruit before it's a tree. You know, it, it doesn't become a tree once it makes fruit. And so in the same way, the, the Word of God comes, and then the Word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, grows into faith, and then that faith produces good works. You can't expect the good works to, to then produce a tree. I mean, it does then, that fruit becomes maybe a tree some other place, but that's not you. That's a different tree, right? And so in the same way, you, you share the gospel and you, you go and you love people, and the Holy Spirit will, will use uh, that when it is appropriate theology, right, to create uh, faith in another tree some other place, but it has no effect on the tree that's already there, right? A good tree makes good fruit because it's a good tree. It's not a good tree because it makes good fruit, it makes good fruit because it's a good tree, right? And, and if you have to understand it in that order, if you're looking for works before you're looking uh, before, you know, or in order to be uh, saved or, or faith or whatever, then you're, you're looking for life in a graveyard, you know? And, and the only place you're going to find that is probably in Jesus's tomb, you know? Hmm. Dead people don't yeah. do anything except rot and spread disease, so don't go to them looking for anything good. Life must come first. And and that's that's Jesus. That's the gospel. That's a be- that's a picture that Jesus teaches, Paul uses, Luther picks up on it all the time. And he preaches like this. I thought this was too simple. But he preaches the gospel like this. He says, "You know if you love somebody, they can do all sorts of miserable things and you put up with it. If you hate somebody, they can do it doesn't matter how good the good works they do are. You do, you just hate the person, so you hate the works that they do." And Luther says this is something similar with the gospel. The Lord Je- because of the death of the Lord Jesus, God loves you. You do you do not annoy God. He in fact delights in you. In f- I, I I heard someone preach this one time and I, I tried to copy it himself. I thought it was so wonderful. It's not just that God loves you. He, in fact, likes you. He delights in you. He, he calls you his friend. And that is the goal of theology, friendship with Christ, that sinners who should be God's enemies, who are born God's enemies, are transformed to become the friends of God, the, the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God. And theology, theology done right, theology done according to God's word, gets us to that point that we also are called the sons of God. Pastor Linnell, just an absolutely a delight to have you on the show today. Uh, any, maybe 30 seconds or so to wrap it up. Any final thoughts? Uh, just to, you know, to, to say again, because I think it uh, a lot of times gets missed or people don't understand, this is not an academic thing. Uh, you can you can continue to learn and to grow in it, but this is something that we do at home with our families, with our children, with our friends. Uh, that's that's the right place for theology, for the proper application of law and gospel. And if you know your your pastor is doing that for you, then he's doing it to you like a friend, like a, a you know a father, a, a husband. Because I'm I am those things, uh, and and so this is this is for you also. It's the theology. thing that God it, has given us all. That's right. Our joy, our life, our peace. Our confidence, the Lord's word, that brings us to life eternal. Thanks for joining us on Cross Defense. We'll be back next Monday. Keep tearing apart the world's ideas and building it up with God's. Cross Defense, produced by Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Your support is vital for this program to continue. To learn about giving opportunities, call Mary at 314-996-1518. Or you can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Cross Defense on Worldwide KFUO.